Hey everyone, welcome to another interview. I am very excited about our guest today. We have Reverend Dr. Graham Hill, who's the Vice Principal at Morling Theological College in Sydney. Uh, just a stone's throw from where I am right now, but we're still gonna connect online because of the 21st century, and why not? Uh, he is the founding director of the Global Church Project and author of a couple of books, uh, Global Church, Reshaping Our Conversations, Renewing Our Mission, Revitalizing Our Churches, and Salt, Light, and a City, Introducing Missional Ecclesiology. Graham, welcome. It's lovely to be here with you. Thanks for having me. No worries. I'm very appreciative of being able to get into your work and, and uh, yeah, get excited to talk about this whole topic today. Uh, so going right into it, you've written the book, as I said before, Global Church, Reshaping Our Conversations, Renewing Our Mission, and Revitalizing Our Churches. And you also, I guess, curate a immensely resourced website, a really great website, which is theglobalchurchproject.com. Uh, could you give us a little overview of the book and the website and some things that you're hoping to achieve through them? Yeah, the background for it uh, all is that I, I was doing some writing on what does it mean for the church to be missional in Western society? And uh, as you mentioned, I, I wrote a, an original work on what missional church looks like. But one of the comments that came back from a lot of people was that you've only really engaged Western thinkers and authors. Now, this comment was made to me in about 2012. So what I thought I'd do is go on a journey and explore what is God doing in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and other parts of the world. And what can we learn about church and discipleship and mission from those places? That was the kind of the genesis of the journey. And then I, I did some research. I wrote the Global Church book. And when I, in that particular book, I explore what can we learn about discipleship and mission and worship and church and ministry and evangelism, a whole range of areas um, from outside the West, from the majority world. And um, so that was, that was the book. And I finished the book at the end of 2015 and I was about to write another book. And my wife said to me, you know, Graham, you academics, you love your books. Mm -hmm. But these days, people love the new media. So why don't you get on the road with your cameras and film Christian leaders from all around the world and just explore with them what God is doing? And that, that led to the film series, the Global Church Project film series that is at the website that you mentioned. That's exciting. And it's just great to be able to spotlight some of these stories that, you know, previously because of, you know, not being able to travel or not having the technology, we wouldn't have heard. So that's Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, the subtitle of your book has three uh, intriguing statements that I thought might be helpful to kind of take each in turn to and unpack a little. So the first one, uh, reshaping our conversations. Uh, now, you've posed the question on whether the church and whether our church and mission talk is Western centred or global centred mm. and have advocated strongly for the latter. Uh, could you maybe expand on why this is important and some practical ways that we can identify which labels our community might fall under? Yeah, so um, by way of background to that conversation, it's been amazing to watch the exponential growth of the global church. So between 1900 and 2010, the church in the West probably doubled in size. Um, so there has been some growth, but um, <coughs> it hasn't been keeping up with population growth. Whereas the church in the majority world, and by majority world, of course, I mean Africa, Asia, Latin America, basically anywhere that isn't Western today, mm. the church in the majority world grew by about 1,400% in the same period. Now, if it continues to grow at that pace, it will grow by 2,500% by 2030. So the growth of the majority world church has been absolutely exponential. But the problem is that the church in the West is the church that is resourced. Uh, the, it's the church that has the platform. Um, if you look at most of the book contracts are given to white, middle-aged, Western men, mm. I'm describing myself here. <laughs> yeah. So most of the book contracts, I mean, most of the conferences you go to around the world today are headlined by, by white males. And it still feels like even though the church outside the West has been growing exponentially, in fact, the majority of the church today is not in the West. It's outside the West. Yet still, we have this Western mindset. 
Uh, our books are written by Western people. Our conferences are headlined by Western people. When we want to think about how to grow and develop the church, we read Western authors and so on. And so what I'm asking is, how can we have a more global mindset? How can we pay attention and to what God is doing outside of the West? How can we hear the voices of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Indigenous communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Latin Americans, and so on, Caribbeans and those from the, the Pacific, Oceania? How can we pay attention to those voices and learn together with them? Sometimes when I talk like this, people think that what I'm saying is, we have to ignore what God is doing in the West and just listen to other voices. But I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we need a global conversation. There's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from the West. We've got a lot of resources. There's been some really creative theology. But vice versa, we can learn so much about mission, about confidence in scripture, about discipleship, about passion in worship, about the power of the Holy Spirit from the global church. So what I'm asking for is that we cultivate a global conversation where Westerners learn from the church outside the West, where the church outside the West learns from Western conversations, where Africans learn from Asians, where Asians learn from Middle Easterns, a global conversation begins to grow. And I guess to go back to your question, um, how do we know if our mindset or our conversations are too Western and not global? I guess ask ourselves, who am I reading? Who headlines the conferences that I go to? Who are the, when I look at the, the, the reading lists that I, in the college curriculum, who wrote those books? Um, when you begin to ask those questions, you begin to see whether really you're a part of a global conversation or a very narrow Western conversation. Yeah, I think that's totally true. I think I was one of the, those things that I had to learn along the way. It was that, you know, who are you reading? Who are you listening to? Do they all look like you? And if so, that's probably, that's an issue. Uh, so yeah. that's a really great challenge. And, and that mutual learning is something that we can really grab onto. So I think that's exceptional. Yeah, an example of this is that I'm, I'm very interested in missional theology or missional church. And I noticed only recently that all of the reading lists that come out about what it means for the church to be missional are written by people who look like me mm -hmm. and who are educated in the same kind of institutions as me. And I begin to think, really, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, all of the growth, really, of the global church has been, in the last couple of decades, has been in Africa and Asia, and to a lesser extent in Latin America. And there's been truckloads of books on mission and evangelism written by people from those cultures. And then also, when you look at the growth of the church in Western contexts, almost all of that growth has been in immigrant communities, in the diaspora. And people like Soon Chan Ra, Grace Ji Sun Kim, who I know you've interviewed, and others, have been writing lots of books about what it means for the church to be missionary and engage with society. And yet, for some reason, those books are not turning up on the missional church reading list. Mm. And so we need to ask ourselves, what's going on and how did that happen? And how can we have a truly global mindset today? Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really good challenge. Uh, so the second statement is renewing our mission. Uh, now, you've written on the need for missional movements to be born from the margins. Uh, I felt this was helpful as... I think much of the discomfort around mission, which, you know, I myself have experienced is because we picture it as like, you know, in the past as the Western center being imposed on the margins, on global mm. margins. Um, now you write, this is a quote here, a mission born at the margins challenges the usual questions and their religious power based assumptions. It asks mm. disruptive and disturbing questions about religion, wealth, identity, national pride, race, and gender relations, power, and more. So, how might we center our mission at the margins, both locally and globally? Yeah, so we often forget that um, God doesn't only place the margins at the center of his love and concern and mission, but he begins movements there. So I think it's J. Akuma Christian who once wrote that monuments are built at the center, but movements 
are born at the margins. They thrive at the margins, they spread out from the margins. In fact, sometimes we forget, I think, often uh, in Western settings that we've known so much cultural power for so long that we forget that God's mission is from the margins, that Jesus was a Galilean Jew, that he didn't just care about the margins, that he was from the margins himself. Um, We forget about that. Mm -hmm. And that it's from the margins that things like power and... um, uh, it, it, I guess it's difficult to know how to talk about this. I mean, sometimes the, we, we lose sight of the fact, those of us that have known cultural power for a long time, we lose sight of the fact of the way in which power and centrality has shaped our, has shaped our theology. It's shaped the way that we understand mission and evangelism in so many ways, subtle ways, But then what we need to begin to to, to understand is that the the church is at its best when it's birthed at the margins and when it thrives at the margins. So an example of this is the church in in China, for instance. I mean, at its current rate of growth, the church in China will have more Christians than all of North America combined. So Canada and the USA combined by probably by about 2040, there'll be more Christians in China. But the church in China has been birthed and has thrived at the margins of society. And the church is always best when it's at the margins, I believe. I mean, recently I did an interview with a, with a head of a theological college in Mongolia. And all of the church in Mongolia are first-generation Christians. I mean, only 2% of the Mongolian society are Christians, but that church is thriving. In 1990, there were only four Christians in Mongolia. Today, 25 years later, there are probably something around, somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 Christians in Mongolia today. But that church has been thriving. It's been growing exponentially at the margins. So I would say we've got to get better at listening to what God is doing at the margins. Wherever the church is at the centre of culture, at the centre of power, wherever church has been kind of wedded to the centre of culture, it's usually stagnated or gone into decline. Wherever the church is at the margins, it's usually thrived and grown and become exponential, if you like. And it's important for us to pay attention to that. I'll tell you one other final story. I was, uh, I was staying at a backpacker's hostel in Manila about um, 20 years ago, and I was woken up early in the morning by sobbing. And I noticed that below me in a bunk was an old uh, Vietnamese man, and I discovered that every morning he would rise early and he would get on his knees, and for hours he would sob and pray for the church in Vietnam. And he began to tell me the story how 20 years ago he had planted a church in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, And that church had only been about 10 people. But he estimated over a period of 20 years that group had grown from 20 people to something like 40,000 Christians. But during that time, they'd suffered great persecution and humiliation. He told me that four or five of of his brothers had been taken away by the secret police and murdered. They suffered persecution and humiliation and beating, but the church had grown exponentially. And I I thought it was like listening to the story of the early church. And it reminded me that the church at the margins, often in persecution, is the church that grows and thrives worldwide. So we need to get better at listening to the margins. Yeah, fantastic. That's a really good, that's a powerful story. Um, you said also just following that, that missional movements from the margins disturb and disrupt the status quo. Uh, just mm. what are your thoughts of like what some of these characteristics of this status quo, you know, the church and culture uh, that need disrupting? Yeah. So I think that sometimes when church is, is wedded to the center of a culture, it begins to take on some of the cultural values when it comes to finances mm-hmm. or gender relations or modes of communication 
or even the way in which we organise our life together. But when church, the church is at the margins of society, it has to question a lot of those things. It has to ask questions about how do we organise our life together? So I only just realised recently that, how do I talk about this? I'd always thought to myself that the early church was very concerned about the role of women. And the early church was very concerned about the role of the poor. And I thought, isn't that wonderful how charitable and how egalitarian the early church was? And it's just recently that I realized that I had completely misunderstood how central women, how central the poor, how central the marginalized were to the whole shape of the early church. It wasn't like the early church was full of a group of men who decided they would care about the poor or they would try to be more egalitarian or they would try to, you know, um, redistribute their wealth. The way that we need to think about this is that when the, early, when the church is at the margins of society, when the powerful are not at the center of the life of the church, then those groups that are typically at the margins of society not only are at the center of the life of the church, and those are usually women, the marginalized, the poor, the sick, the disabled, not only are those groups at the center of the life of the church, but they shape the whole way that the church sees itself. They shape the church's theology, they shape the church's mission, they shape the church's understanding of, the, of itself and the way that it it um, the way that it shares its common goods, the way that it comes together regularly for common meals. What I'm describing here is the early church, but I'm also what I'm describing is the church whenever the church is at the margins. And this disrupts the status quo. I mean, one of the reasons I think the early church was so political, one of the reasons why I think the church was so heretical or uncomfortable for Roman society was that it, it constantly prodded, it constantly questioned, it constantly scandalised the status quo. Women were at the centre of its life. The sick, the poor, wealth was redistributed. And all of these things are political statements, really. And so, I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but I think you're <laughs> yeah, whenever the church is at the margins, whenever it begins to demonstrate these kinds of characteristics, it really makes political statements. Mm. Another way to say this is Stanley Halvar says that, that the, the most political thing that the church can do is be the church. Um, the church doesn't have a political strategy. The church is a new politic. Mm. The church doesn't have a social ethic. The church is a social ethic. The church doesn't have a social strategy. The church is a social strategy. So whenever the church is at the margins, it disrupts, it questions, it scandalizes. It, um, it's always pushing back against the status quo. Yeah, that's fantastic. I like that a lot. Um, so the third statement in the, in the tagline is revitalizing our churches. Now you've written on the, uh, we've written recently on the need for church and missional movements to take seriously things like the ecological crisis, gender inequality and structural injustice faced by indigenous peoples, especially indigenous Australians in our context. So how does mission informed by the global church and uh, woke to issues such as those just identified, how does that revitalize our churches? Yeah, I think it revitalizes our churches because it helps us understand further about how God's mission involves all of humanity, mm -hmm. the whole human person and all of creation. And so one thing that I discovered, especially when I was interviewing Christian leaders from all over the world, is how we're tempted as Westerners to polarise things or to form dichotomies. So we often think about secular, sacred, proclamation or social justice. We think about evangelism or creation care. 
But when I travelled through Africa and Asia, what I discovered is that those kinds of polarities make no sense at all to Christians in Asia or mm. Africa or Indigenous and Aboriginal communities. They think, what are you talking about? And they say to me things like, Graham, why are you, why are you so passionate about bringing these things back together? I don't even understand why they were ever separated. Mm. <laughs> The idea that you would try to pull these things apart just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we're going to be truly missional in the world today, we can't do that without a passion for creation care. There's, there is no such thing as a missional theology without eco-justice or eco-theology. Similarly, how can you be missionary if you don't care about refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented migrants, the plight of indigenous and Aboriginal people. I just don't see how you can do it. And it just doesn't reflect the mission right at the heart of God and the kind of witness that these communities, majority world and indigenous communities present to us. And so this is, this is really my passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why I'm so concerned for us paying attention to these things. Yeah, that is such a good point and it's something that I really hope that we can take on board and be a good to under discussing groups, how that and how we can be living that out. Um, so you recently, just shifting gears away from the book a bit, you recently made a pledge and you kind of touched on this a bit in your first response, um, not to speak on panels or at conferences unless there are women or, and or people of colour included as speakers. Uh, could you talk a little bit, I mean, you've already kind of touched on a bit of where this came from, but maybe then maybe more touch on some of the response that you've had to this pledge. Yeah. So the response to the pledge has been mixed. Hmm. Uh, so I've had a lot of support from normally from minority groups and from women. There's been a lot of support. Hmm. Where I've had some pushback has been from the usual suspects. Those who I think have known uh, privilege and power and access to opportunities for a long time. So Basically, the, the pledge was that we would not speak at, on panels or at conferences where women are not able to speak as well or where minority groups are not invited to speak as well. And my concern from this comes from a number of different things. I mean, and it, fundamentally, it's a theological concern. I do have a concern that diversity has been co-opted by political correctness, even though I don't like that term, or it's been co-opted by pragmatism. I think we need to have a passion for diversity that comes out of a, a theological vision for the new humanity in Christ. And if that passion for diversity comes out of a theological vision, then it makes us ask questions like, why is it when you look at the top 35 conferences in the United States, that 81% 80, of the speakers at those conferences are males. Mm -hmm. And why is it that when you look at the top 35 Christian conferences in the United States, that 89% of all the speakers are white? So 81% of them are males, 89% of them are white. And something terribly wrong is going on there, particularly when you look at the, when you look at the church in the United States, and you see that that doesn't reflect the makeup of the church in the United States. So something that's gone terribly wrong there, you know, and even if you look at, at um, what percentage of the global church are women and, or are, are non, non whites. And when you look at the statistics, you would say that probably 90 to the 95% of the global church are female and are not white. Only 5% of the church's global population look like me. Yeah. So something has gone terribly wrong. And so what I'm asking uh, us to do as a church is to say, we're going to take a stand. I'm not going to speak again at conferences that don't invite women to speak or, or minority groups to speak. And I'm inviting conference organisers to take a strong stand where they will not organise conferences that are filled with white, male, Western speakers. And not because we want to have some sort of pay lip service or be pragmatic about diversity, 
but rather because we have a theological conviction that God is creating a new humanity made up of men and women of all ethnicities, languages and cultures. The vision of revelation drives us in this commitment. That's awesome. I, it is a, a great thing to be calling out and a corrective to be made. I, I was reflecting on it after I read your post about it that um, I think it was uh, Rachel Held Evans and Nadia Bowles Weber organized a conference with all female speakers called Why Christian? And they continually kept getting questions of, oh, so is this a women's conference? Um, and it wasn't. It was a conference for anyone. But it was so jarring to people that you would never see a conference of all male speakers and be like, oh, it's only for men, I guess, because um, we've assumed that's for everyone. But it was something so in our minds that, oh, we'd, it's so weird just to see all women up there that it mustn't be for me as a man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it's good the, I'm very connected with Missio Alliance and, in America, and they're very committed, I think, to, to diversity. And recently they ran a, a She Leads, it's called She Leads, a uh, conference on promoting uh, women leadership further in the church. And one of the creative things that they did was that there were a lot of female speakers about, about women in leadership and in ministry, but they also got uh, uh, men engaged in the conversation mm. uh, and they got people from a variety of ethnicities and minority groups involved in the conversation. I love the way that they are committed, for instance, to the diversity of the body of Christ. That's great. That's a good one for people to check out. Uh, so one final question, Graham, um, kind of a broader scope, visioning ahead kind of thing. Uh, what is your hope for the quote unquote average suburban Australian church in say 2025? Yeah. I mean, my, my passion really is that churches would, have renewed mission so that they would have a fresh insight about how to engage with their local communities, their local neighbourhoods, that churches would be revitalised in a way that, that mission and evangelism and discipleship and ministry would be renewed and revitalised. So that's my hope. And I'm a firm believer that the way that we can do that is to be a part of global conversations. So. There's a word that often goes around, and you've probably heard it. It's, about, it's called glocalization, Glo um, and it's a combination of the local and the global. I firmly believe that all local conversations are influenced by global conversations, and all global Christian conversations are influenced by local conversations. Um, and so... My vision and my hope for local churches and local disciples is that they would have vital, alive, dynamic conversations engaged in global conversations that would not only revitalize what's happening at local level, but that would also revitalize the global church because the local is always in the global and the global is always in the local. That's a, that's a great way to finish. Thank you so much, Graham. So, Thanks so much for having me. No worries. So coming out of this, people are obviously going to have watched this interview. They're going to share this interview with their friends. They're going to go over and bookmark the globalchurchproject.com so they can read all the excellent blogs and watch the videos and the podcast. They're going to buy the Global Church book. And so after they've done all that and subscribe to this YouTube channel, so after you've done all that, Graham, how else can people connect in with what you're doing? Well, you can uh, buy one of my books from Amazon. The Global Church is the book that I've most recently released. Right. And you can go to my website, theglobalchurchproject.com. And on the website, there are blog posts, there are podcasts, there are videos, there are a range of books and interviews that you can look at. Yeah. Theglobalchurchproject.com. Right. It really is one of the most well-resourced sites I've found. So people should really check that out. Um, and content goes up really regularly. So... Uh, stay on it. And um, Graham is a good follow on Twitter as well. So if you're a Twitter person, uh, check it out so you can keep up to date with it all. Uh, Thanks Graham, so much for having me. No worries. Thank you very much.